Hello, anatomy colleagues. This is Dr. Alsup, and in this mini lecture, we're going to talk about the organization of bone tissue. And there's really two main types of organization. There's going to be compact bone, and there's going to be spongy bone. And you'll actually find that those names are pretty descriptive of what they look like grossly. And then we're going to talk about a few of the specific structures that are going to make up this organization. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty detail. We're going to talk about some of these overarching themes. So again, there are going to be two major organizational types of bone tissue named um, pretty, pretty accurately. So you're going to have a compact bone, which is going to appear very compact, pretty dense. And then you're going to have spongy bone, which is named for its more sponge-like appearance, as you can see here. Um, this right here is actually going to be spongy bone. I'll talk about some differing terminologies in a moment, and one of those is obviously going to be trabecular bone, as you can see here in this image. Now, if you're looking at the compact bone, you really don't see any holes, you don't see any spaces other than obviously this fairly large marrow or medullary cavity in the middle of the diaphysis. But for the most part, you have a very solid portion of bone. One other thing that you likely notice as well in terms of the compact bone is where it is located. We're looking at a cross section of a femur. The femur is the longest long bone of the body. And it is making up the bulk of the diaphysis or the body or the shaft of a long bone. But one other thing that's maybe not quite as easy to see is that it is lining the ends of the long bone as well. So while the majority of the epiphyses is going to be made up of this spongy type of bone, you will always have an outer line or outer lining of compact bone throughout. So even a bone that's made up of almost majority spongy bones, such as what we have with the flat bones of the skull, uh, the vertebrae, the sternum, those are mostly made up of spongy bone, but you will always have that outer lining of compact bone, which makes sense because really that compact bone is playing a huge role in terms of protection. Um, it's going to play a role in terms of tensile strength, strength and bending associated with it. So you will always have that outer layer of compact bone. Now, if you're looking closer at a spongy bone, again, these are going to be located more on the ends or within the ends of the long bone. So those epiphyses, um, so important in terms of formation of joints. And then you will have it making up the bulk of some of the more irregular bones, the short bones, the flat bones, um, say of the skull, those are going to be made up of majority spongy bone. And you can see it's containing these larger spaces within. So you can actually visibly or grossly see the spaces within spongy bone. Also, this is going to play a role in terms of strength and compression. And those trabeculae or these little beams of bone are really well organized in order to resist stress from multiple directions, which you often have when we're talking about in joints. Uh, before we move further, I do want to take a terminology break because you can hear these organizational types referred to in, in many different ways. Uh, one of those we just saw in that previous image, the spongy bone is sometimes referred to as trabeculae or trabecular bone because those little beams of bones that you can visibly see in spongy bone are referred to as trabeculae. In fact, trabecular is the term that I use, or learned when I was first learning anatomy. So um, trabecular, you may hear for spongy bone. Cancellous, you may also hear. Uh, cancellous or cancelli in Latin means crossbars. So really those trabeculae often do look like crossbars. Um, in, in uh, composition. So you may hear spongy, trabecular, cancellous. When we're talking about compact bone, sometimes you hear this referred to as cortical. When you think, hear cortical, think an outer layer, and that makes sense. Compact bone is always going to be the outer layer of bone. Um, so that's sometimes you hear referred to as that. Sometimes you hear referred to as dense bone because that's what it looks like. It looks quite dense. You don't have that, that those larger spaces as you do in the spongy bone. So 
I'm kind of buying myself a little leeway here in case I use some of those terms as I discuss. Um, but in terms of any type of assessment, I will use the terms compact or spongy, but you may hear these other terms as well. All right, so let's take a deeper dive into the microscopic structure of compact bones specifically, and then we'll talk about some of the structures that are shared between the two. Um, because recall, if you look with unaided eye at compact bone, it just looks like a solid block of bone. You don't see these um, really complex microscopic canals and spaces that are present even in compact bone. And those are really important in terms of being able to get neurovasculature into this region. Now, a major difference between compact bone and spongy bone is that compact bone is going to be organized in what's referred to as an osteon. More traditionally, you hear it referred to as a haversian system. And these are just these structural units that are aligned in the same direction along lines of stress. Generally, these are going to be along the longitudinal axis of a bone. Uh, it's really important to note that these lines of stress are dynamic. So these can change throughout life. Sometimes you have some fairly large changes that occur, say with juveniles that are um, learning how to walk. Those lines of stress will change quite dramatically. You can also change them throughout life um, with differing, uh, differing aspects of walking or not walking. Uh, weight training can change these lines of stress. So the osteons do change throughout life. They do break down throughout life. You do develop new ones throughout life. But really, compact bone is going to be organized in these systems. And you can see, just kind of looking at these, it's kind of, you can see one that's kind of pulled up through here. Um, but you can see, looking at this cross section, just the amount of osteons that you're going to have um, associated with compact bone. Now, if you're ever, um, if you've ever seen a microscopic section of compact bone, it almost looks like you're looking at tree rings. So you have these tree rings kind of, of circling around a central opening or canal, literally referred to as a central canal. So you have these tree rings or maybe even like the layers of an onion that are kind of getting increasing diameter as you get away from that central canal. And these rings or these kind of plates of bone are referred to as concentric lamellae. So let's, let's discuss the term lamellae uh, before we move on, because it's going to come up again as well. Lamellae means plate-like. And what you have are these concentric or circular plate-like components of mineralized or calcified extracellular matrix. Uh, and this is going to be dispersed and dispersed throughout, you will have osteocytes kind of within. So if you're looking at this microscopic section here, all these dots throughout here are going to be osteocytes that are sitting within these little pits or these little um, divots within referred to as lacunae. So you'll have that mineralized or calcified extracellular matrix that's going to form these ever increasing in diameter concentric lamellae around what's referred to as a central canal. And a central canal is the means by which neurovasculature, so nerves, arteries, veins, as well as lymphatics are going to get to these deeper portions of the bone and supply or innervate these individual osteons. Now, along the length of a central canal, so remember that central canal is right here in the middle, of an osteon, along its length, you're gonna have these perforating canals, which are getting the, the branches from outside of the bone into these deeper portions. And these were referred to as perforating, sometimes you hear them referred to as Volkmann's canals. And so how this happens is on, for each bone, at least you'll have at least what's one, nutrient foramen. And this is a hole by which um, a branch, branches from outside of the bone actually enter into the bone. And the nutrient foramen will open into these perforating or Volkmann canals. These perforating or Volkmann canals will get that neurovasculature to that central canal in order to supply 
those osteons. So one thing I, I do want to please, please, please don't forget how important neurovasculature is to a bone's function. It's remember bone is dynamic. It's living. It needs that arterial supply. It needs venous drainage to get rid of waste. It needs innervation um, in order for it to function properly. So these perforating canals and these central canals are central to the, uh, to the function and the survival of bone. Now there's another type of lamellae that I want to mention before we move on that's associated with compact bone. And this is referred to as circumferential lamellae. So not concentric lamellae, circumferential, going around the entire circumference, outer circumference, as well as the inner circumference of, um, of a bone. So you'll have, again, you'll have these external or outer, so the surrounding the outside of the bone, as well as an internal or inner, so kind of surrounding the medullary cavity region as well. And really, um, these are the both of these types are important, but this external or outer portion is actually going to have an attachment as well to the periosteum uh, via what's referred to as perforating or Sharpie's fibers. And um, th this connection is important because these fibers are not only going to interweave between the periosteum and the bone, but it will interweave with fibers associated with ligaments and tendons, so making, making this musculoskeletal functional unit that's important in terms of movement, as well as in terms of growth. Um, this circumferential lamellae is going to also play a role in terms of what's referred to as appositional growth or growth of the outer surface. And this is really important in terms of bone width growth. So if you're going, you'll obviously have bone length growth that we'll talk about in more detail in a moment, but you also can have bone that's going to grow um, and increase the width of bone. And so these circumferential lamellae play an important role here. So if you're looking here, this is indicating the periosteum, and then you will have these long lamellae surrounding the entirety of the bone. So the circumferential lamellae is not organized in these osteon units. It's going to surround the outside of the bone as well as the inside or around that medullary cavity as well. Now, spongy bone has many of the same stru structures that we just described associated with compact bone. So there will be concentric lamellae. It's going to be organized in these trabecula trabeculae. You'll obviously have osteocytes. You have to have osteocytes in terms of the communication between the two. But spongy bone is not organized in osteons. Okay, so you don't have that specific functional unit. You don't have central canals. If you think about it, um, any osteocyte in the spongy bone is not very far away from any of these spaces in between, which is filled with marrow. Marrow has a very rich vascular supply, so that's how it's getting its nourishment and drainage in that region. Now, it does, if you're looking at a, a spongy portion of bone, it does look like these trabeculae are kind of just willy-nilly kind of all over the place, but it, they are very um, functionally organized along lines of stress. And it's going to be in areas where you have stress kind of coming from multiple directions often. And so it, while it does look like it's unorganized, it's actually quite organized in terms of how um, it is it's going to present. And again, these larger spaces that are visible to the naked eye are going to be filled with bone marrow. It could be red bone marrow, depending on uh, what age that individual is or the type of bone, or it could be yellow bone marrow. All right, excellent. So we've covered the basics of compact and spongy bone. Now let's review a concept through a question. All right, so the diaphysis of a long bone is formed predominantly by which type of bone? Is it compact or is it spongy? To pause the video if needed. And when you are ready, I hope you have landed on compact. And in order to answer that, you have to first of all understand what the diaphysis is. So recall, you have to go back to your knowledge from a previous video that diaphysis, sometimes it's referred to as the body of a long bone or the shaft of the long bone. Basically, it's the long portion of the long bone. 
Um, in the middle, you have that medullary cavity that's going to be hollow, other than during life, it's going to be filled with marrow. But the actual bony portion of it is, um, is going to be exclusively composed of compact bone. If you get more into the marrow cavity, you may have some spongy bone there, but the majority is going to be made up of this compact bone. You'll also have compact bone recall along the, the ends of the epiphyses. So the majority of an epiphysis or the ends of the bone will be spongy bone, but you'll always have that protective layer of compact bone on the outside. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for your time and attention here. And I hope you have an excellent rest of your day.